it's also important to look uh, for the future of the system. So today the topic for sure is cashless economy. So what can cashless economy contribute to tax transparency and more fairness, but also to growth? Because finally we growth, growth lead to more tax revenues because only tax increase will not lead uh, at all to more and higher tax revenues finally. So what can be done and what is the impact of a cashless economy? So first we have the member of parliament as the floor is yours to give us your, your keynote uh, and your, your, your opening. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Dear colleagues, first of all, thank you very much for, for this invitation. It's a pleasure to, to share this uh, webinar with you. A special hello to Paul Rubik, an ancient colleague from, from the group, because uh, I used to be in uh, the European Parliament 10 years ago, just for one year, and then I was called home to be Minister of State for EU Affairs. And I was back to Parliament last year, so a special hello to, to Paul. And, and thank you very much, really, to both uh, SME Connect uh, and, uh, and the Taxpayers Association for this uh, invitation. You know, I am one of those in uh, the EPP Econ Fisk team who is always speaking in favor of fair tax competition. Uh, I have to say that at this moment, I feel in a minority in, um, in the Fisk. Uh, uh, subcommittee, which was just established in uh, the European uh, Parliament. But I think that fair tax competition is good, especially for SMEs, and it's good for the entire European Union's competitiveness. Actually, it has become already um, um, a common uh, place to say that SMEs are the backbone of our economy. Uh, but I truly believe that they are, and we have to do our utmost that they feel comfortable, especially now in crisis times, when most of them, they are struggling for surviving. This issue, what we are talking about is even extremely timely. Uh, you have to know that the European Parliament just voted today, uh, uh, it's an own initiative report uh, and a new strategy for European SMEs. The commission came up with an SME strategy in March, early days of March, actually when we start, we had this, we, the, we were at the very beginning of the present health crisis. I think uh, most of its elements has to be rewritten just because of the completely unchanged uh, situation. Uh, what is, and let me just quote certain uh, points of this uh, uh, resolution. Uh, we insist on a drastic reduction of bureaucracy for SMEs. Uh, uh, we even included uh, the importance of a binding SME test, uh, uh, which would mean, and actually I was very much in favor of that already in the EPP, that each and every new piece of legislation should, uh, the adoption should be um, preceded by a test that what kind of impact it would have on SMEs. So we MEPs should have clearly a clear vision that what this new piece of proposal uh, would uh, mean for them to, because very often the, the, the purpose of a piece of legislation can have different effect on big players than and small players. In the report, we also say that we have to uh, guarantee better access to finance uh, for SMEs, and we urge to tackle unfair competition uh, on taxation rules between SMEs and multinational corporations. And needless to say that the fight against tax fraud, evasion, and avoidance is, um, is vital. So what we definitely need, especially now in crisis times, to somehow help and improve the business environment, um, the administrative and regulatory environment for, for SMEs, and of course, tax policies would be an important uh, 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 contribution to, to that. But there is a serious debate on, um, on uh, taxation, and I was referring to that at the very beginning of my introduction, not only between left and right in the parliament, but also between the commission and some member states on what a good tax policy is. 
We know that in the European Union, it is a national competence. It's not a common competence. And indeed, we can also see that in individual price that there is no unanimity and consistency among member states on that issue. Uh, just let me mention what happens with the Common Consolidated Corporate Tax Base Initiative or what happened to, to the uh, EU-wide and EU-wide financial transaction test. Both of them have been um, uh, already under negotiations and actually there is no result on, uh, on, on those. But I'm convinced that the modern and an innovative tax, uh, taxation policy is essential for promoting even the European recovery. Uh, and actually it should be based, and I'm strongly convinced about it, on tax reduction. With the condition that a country can afford reducing taxes. So I always combine tax reduction to have a competitive taxation policy if a member state can afford it, which means that uh, it has sound uh, public finances to, to that, that without taking the risk of not being able to collect enough taxes. Uh, we have to find a ways how to uh, have less burden uh, on, on, on SMEs. Uh, um, because um, as I mentioned, they are especially fragile now in the present uh, situations. Fortunately, several member states have already taken uh, measures to alleviate pressures created by the pandemic. These have included deferral of tax payments and or social con uh, security contributions, extension of filing deadlines and exemption of cancellation of tax payments, etc. However, we are facing a second wave of the pandemic now, and many firms continue to struggle to, to survive and, and to remain uh, sustainable. Uh, and, uh, and many of them might even face the risk of insolvency. So it's crucial to continue with both tax policy and tax administration measures, helping them to recover. And just uh, uh, finally, uh, some uh, considerations to you. On, on the Hungarian story, which I think is a good example how to create a favorable tax environment for uh, SMEs. Since 2010, we have taken significant steps towards the improvement of the, uh, our uh, tax uh, uh, system. First, what we did was shifting taxes from labor to consumption type taxes. By this, we lowered the company tax and the, the, the personal income tax with the idea that uh, to give an, um, to, to incentivate the companies to create jobs, to, to foster their activities, and even people to earn more because then they can remain with, with more. And those who have more will consume more, will pay more VAT and more consumption type uh, taxes. The second was we increased the effectiveness of our tax collection by simplification of the tax uh, system, reducing the tax compliance cost and combating shadow economy. So we introduced, for example, an online cash register in 2014. Now all uh, shops have to be uh, online connected to the national tax authority. So to reduce the chance of tax avoidance. We also introduced the electronic public road trade control system in 2015. And with the promotion of electronic payments through the POS terminal installations, we managed again to collect more taxes. And as a result of all that, the uncollected VAT showed a significant uh, uh, drop. And we estimate that the VAT gap in 2013, uh, which was then 21%, it's dropped significantly to 8.4% by 2018. In, during the pandemic, uh, my government made a 56 tax adjustments. Uh, sectors that were seriously hit by the pandemic are exempted from paying social security contributions and payroll taxes. We introduced further simplifications for the tax regime uh, in 26 activities, which are extremely seriously injured by the crisis. We deleted temporarily the, the tourism tax, the small business tax, and, uh, and we modified the submission date of annual tax returns, etc. So all in all, I think 
that with all these measures we we do we do have to help SMEs. We have the means. I mean, both at national and at European uh, uh, level. And the only way out of the crisis is to incentivize uh, uh, the economies. Uh, in Hungary, the 9% corporate trade tax is something that many, for, even foreign investors, find extremely interesting. And, um, and it pays back. Because by reducing taxes, by widening the tax base, by making the economy uh, um, whiter, you do manage to collect more taxes. And I'm actually very proud that in an OECD ranking, uh, we are the country which managed to uh, have the strongest uh, tax reduction in the last uh, years. So thank you so much. I don't want to take most uh, of your, your time. I will be with you for a while, but I cannot promise to be with you because there are other activities in the parliament where I have to attend. Uh, but thank you so much for your invitation. I'm always at your disposal for further contacts. And trust me that I will, as long as I'm in this parliament, I will be in the service of SMEs, of family businesses. This is something on which I would like to work uh, further. And uh, should you require any help or contact or, uh, or just uh, to be aware of your opinion, I will be always at your disposal. Thank you so much. Eniko, thank you very much. It's good to hear that you do something for the backbone of the economy, small and medium uh, entrepreneurs. So thank you very much. Now we come to the keynotes. First, Benjamin Angel, Director of Direct Taxation, Tax Coordination, Economic Analysis and Evaluation, DG Taxwood, European Commission. So the floor is yours. Thank you and thank you for your invitation. The title of this conference was on tax transparency and uh, fairness. I will try to cover both. Starting with tax transparency. Tax transparency is a fundamental value and a necessary step if you want to make progress in the fight against uh, wrong practices. We have done a lot both within the EU and outside the EU. Within the EU, uh, we uh, have developed over the years uh, a robust framework for exchanging tax information, which for part of it uh, derives from the OECD and from another part is uh, completely independent and has been created on top of the uh, various OECD requirements. We have the so-called DAX, the Directive on Administrative Cooperation, uh, which uh, come almost on an annual basis now. We, we just uh, finalized a discussion on DAC 7 called the Internet Platform uh, and are already working on DAC 8. But within this framework, we have managed to boost tax transparency considerably. For instance, at the moment between member states, the annual flow of exchange of tax information is around 100,000 per year. So 100,000 of operation of uh, exchange of tax information on top of the automatic exchange that takes place where no matter what, the information is transferred in bulk. If you take tax rulings, for instance, uh, there is now more than 5,000 tax rulings which are uh, exchanged on an annual basis between member states, which allows to have a much better understanding of uh, what the companies are doing within the internal market. Second, we need more publicity. And you know that the Commission has made a proposal for making public the country by country report. Uh, this this uh, proposal has received uh, support from the European Parliament. The discussion is still ongoing in Council. We, we very much hope that uh, the Portuguese presidency will take it further and will come to a vote on this uh, very important step. I think there is value in transparency because transparency nudges good behavior. Uh, most companies, they want to do the right thing, but the very few companies that don't want to do the right thing, they don't want to be seen as not doing the right thing. So in that sense, having uh, more transparency on the tax situation of companies is a, a powerful driver to uh, fight uh, tax mispractices. Third, uh, digitalization does matter a lot. And there, I would certainly, um, uh, join what the previous speaker said. 
uh, there's a lot that we can do to uh, improve tax transparency and in so doing fight tax fraud and tax evasion by having uh, use actively of innovative instruments. We still suffer in, in Europe from a significant tax gap, particularly in the VAT field. Uh, the, the VAT gap will even increase because of the crisis in, in the coming years, it's, it's mechanical. Uh, but we have um, good experiences. The, the Commission is preparing a, a communication on uh, how to improve the situation as regards the VAT gap. This communication will be published probably in, in spring. Uh, the key message that we want to pass is that there are things that member states can do with the current legislative framework, because very often uh, the spontaneous reflex of all institutions when there is something which is not working well is change the law. And indeed, changing the law sometimes works, but even with the current law and the example uh, given uh, by uh, the member of parliament that put just before me is the right one, you can de facto obtain a very significant improvement in the VAT collection. Both Hungary and Poland actually uh, have managed to bring down considerably the VAT gap within a short period of time. It shows that it's not uh, a problem of legislation only, it's not a cultural problem or a bad habit of citizens. You have really things that you can do that work concretely uh, that will uh, make sure that tax fraud is uh, tackled effectively. Outside the EU, the EU is also uh, very active for pushing third country to adopt good practices in terms of transparency. And the main tool that we're using since 27 is the external part of the code of conduct, whereby via the listing process, we uh, impose among the various requirements that we have, transparency requirements. It is not that we force aggressively European legislation on third country, it's rather that we aggressively promote international convention and international good practices, asking third countries to subscribe to them and telling them that they will be blacklisted if they don't. And this had a very powerful impact since 2017, as, uh, since we made joining those conventions, those international convention part of our requirement, the number of countries having subscribed to them has more than doubled and is now triple digit. And that is directly linked to uh, our effort. Transparency is important, uh, but it is not sufficient to ensure fairness. So we need also other kind of action to ensure fairness. And first, obviously we need measures to fight tax evasion, tax fraud and aggressive tax planning. Uh, this is even more necessary now uh, because of the current economic situation. It is very clear that uh, raising taxes would probably in most country not be as a right thing or smart thing to do in, the, in view of the current difficulty, but making sure that those that should pay taxes, pay taxes is certainly a, a top priority. We have done a lot already in the past via the successive uh, effort of the OECD, uh, BEPS, transposing new legislation, the anti-tax avoidance directive, and even the extra step taken by the EU budget itself. Uh, let me recall, for instance, that for the EU budget in the financial regulation, there is a prohibition on using the union budget to support via guarantees projects that would lead not only to tax evasion and, and, and tax fraud, but also to tax avoidance. So as far as the union budget is concerned, supporting projects leading to tax avoidance is illegal. It's a question of validity of our commitment. But we need to go beyond. So we are in discussion at the moment for reforming the code of conduct on business taxation uh, so as to beef up the mandate of the group so as to step up his capacity to address some uh, national practices that would provoke, uh, trigger distorsive effect within the internal market. Uh, the, this part of the code of conduct exists since 1997, but today it is structured uh, only um, uh, in such a way that it allows to tackle preferential measure. By preferential measure, I mean, if you do a measure which is different for the domestic businesses than it is for uh, the rest of the businesses. 
an old typical example, for instance, many years ago, the uh, company income tax in Ireland was at 15% for Irish company, but 12.5% for foreign company. So that is uh, a typical case of distorted preferential measure. But we need to go beyond this because our experience is that we have seen over the year distortive practices which are not built in a preferential way. And therefore we are discussing a reform of the code of conduct to be able to address those uh, practices. Second, we need solution uh, for the tax sector for which a traditional way of taxing is unfit. And the digital sector is certainly topping that list because this is par ex by excellence, the, the sector for which you tend to have a mismatch between the, the normal way of taxing, which is based on physical location and the reality whereby from one country, wherever in the world, you can almost serve the rest of the planet. Whereas the physical location doesn't matter that much. That is the art of the discussion in the uh, OECD for the pillar one. This discussion, as you know, has been uh, delayed a number of times. Uh, I'm sure the next speaker will uh, extend uh, much further on this, so I will, not, um, I will not develop it further, but I will just recall that irrespective of the OECD calendar, the uh, European Union, Council, Parliament, have also called on the Commission to table a proposal for a non-resource based on a digital levy by June. So, in a couple of months, in June, the Commission will table a specific proposal that will be constructed in such a way that it is OECD compatible, so as to allow uh, the um, possibility to continue the discussion that are taking place. It's a very complex and difficult discussion in the international framework, uh, while ensuring a sustainable flow of income for the EU budget. Third, and and on this one, I will differ from the previous speaker. Uh, we need to prevent the race to the bottom. And in that sense, the second pillar of the discussion of the OECD, that is the one on minimum effective taxation, uh, is also of paramount importance for us. Uh, we uh, face still today a situation where uh, the existence of um, tax haven or uh, of abnormally uh, low rate does create some kind of negative sum gain, pushing companies to uh, use very uh, inventive schemes to uh, benefit of uh, this situation. And that creates a collective loss of tax income at the very moment where almost everyone on the planet needs tax income to uh, finance recovery. Today, for instance, you have 14 jurisdictions in the world with a zero person statutory tax rate, zero. And some of them are relatively important trading partner for the uh, EU pin. So we need to tackle it. The pillar two, as discussed in the OECD, would ensure that we have an effective minimum uh, taxation, uh, or rather that we have a way to enforce a minimum effective taxation. The European Union is committed transpose it as soon as there is an agreement, but we have been clear also that if there is no agreement, we will move as well unilaterally. Uh, there is a very important precedent of a country having moved unilaterally in this field of the United States, and it works quite well in the United States. It's complex, but it works. So we, we have no reason to shy away uh, from our responsibility, and we stand ready, obviously, uh, to do it even though our preference remains an international agreement. So we have to marry transparency and fairness. These are uh, requirement, but also expectation from our citizen, because no one will understand in the current context where uh, the pockets are empty and where member states are facing unprecedented level of public spending and debt that we don't make effort to make sure that the burden of financing the uh, collective well-being in the state is not shared in a fair and equal way, and that we don't make sure that all those that should pay their taxes do so. That will be certainly uh, an important priority for the Commission in the years to come. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker, uh, keynote speaker, Philip Kaffs, Head of International Cooperation Unit OECD.
So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the invitation to, to this event. I, I have to start by uh, apologizing on behalf of our director, Pascal Saint-Amand, who uh, was supposed to be here in my place, uh, but who could not make it uh, in the end. Uh, um, I apologize for that. Um, I, I um, I read actually. I had bit focused a bit more on the uh, the tax transparency and the um, uh, the cashless uh, environment in 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 the title of um, of your um, uh, of this webinar. And uh, I, I will talk a bit about what um, how we see the, um, uh, our work evolving in in, in this area. Um, as you probably all know, tax transparency has been. Uh, very high on the agenda, on the political agenda over the last years. And um, we have made enormous progress um, uh, in the area of tax transparency. Um, and I, I believe that um, the, the, the adoption of the, the common reporting standard in 2014 uh, has been a, a real uh, game changer in the sense that uh, five years ago, uh, tax administrations had no visibility on uh, foreign source passive income of their taxpayers. And now five years later, we have um, over a hundred jurisdictions participating in the CRS, uh, which means that tax authorities have received information from each other on a yearly basis on the financial uh, income uh, that their taxpayers receive from uh, accounts held abroad. This has been uh, significant uh, progress, a milestone, not only because of that, uh, but, but also uh, because it has put in place, I think, a, uh, an infrastructure uh, that existed already within the EU, but not outside of the EU. We now have a, a legal and operational infrastructure, a secure pipeline uh, that permits uh, automatic exchange of information. And uh, this will uh, set, I think, the, the environment for more uh, information exchange to come. Uh, the, the CRS is uh, currently uh, under review. And um, one of the key priorities that we see in this space is cryptocurrencies. Uh, cryptocurrencies um, are not comprehensively covered by the common reporting standard. And uh, we think it is absolutely necessary that we have a global uh, exchange framework for cryptocurrencies. Otherwise we will uh, undermine entirely the integrity of the common reporting standard and cryptocurrencies will become the new cash, um, uh, which uh, represents significant risk for, for tax evasion. This is a, a challenging um, um, area because the players in this world are even more mobile than in the traditional financial sector. Um, and uh, it is also a business that is changing uh, so rapidly that uh, we are, uh, in a way, uh, trying to hit a moving uh, target. As I already mentioned, one of the, the, um, the um, sig an important significance of the work that was done on the CRS is that an exchange framework has been built um, that allows countries to build uh, similar forms of exchange for other areas. And, and one of those areas uh, that uh, we have been working on this year, and I think the EU has been working in the same area, that um, is, the, um, is the sharing and gig economy. Um, this is an area where uh, tax administrations see the growth of this, uh, of this uh, business um, as uh, both something that creates opportunities and risks for them risks because more and more people are um, moving from uh, let's say employment income from getting income through employment to uh, income from independent services and for employment income countries have systems in place to ensure tax compliance uh, uh, wage withholding tax uh, or, or domestic reporting systems the risk is that without any uh, solution uh, that income would escape from, from their radar. And at the same time, opportunities, because a lot of these activities that are now carried out through platforms were formerly uh, carried out through the cash economy. 
Uh, and what we have seen is that many countries uh, were um, developing unilateral solutions to try to get access to the information from the platforms or to impose withholding taxes on, on the uh, or withholding obligations on the platforms, uh, which has its own challenges. Challenges because, um, as um, uh, Benjamin already mentioned, often these platforms are um, active remotely. They do not have a, necessarily have a physical presence in the country uh, of, the, of the markets uh, that they serve. Um, so there are enforcement issues, and at the same time for platforms, these unilateral initiatives uh, lead to a proliferation of reporting regimes, which puts burdens and, and impose bureaucracy on, on the platforms. And that's why we have worked on a, a, a framework which is a bit of a, uh, a, a copy of the common reporting standard, let's say a more friendly version of it, uh, because obviously, obviously this is not uh, an area where we can talk about um, serious tax evasion, uh, but we have implemented model rules uh, that um, allow, that would require that countries can adopt, interested countries can adopt, to, uh, collect to uh, collect information from the platforms that are based in their country and exchange that information with the countries of the, the sellers uh, that are active on these platforms. Uh, we are currently working on this and we have been working together with uh, the EU uh, in this matter to make sure that this works seamlessly together so that uh, foreign platforms that will be uh, based in countries that are um, uh, participating in the exchange from framework um, uh, would be uh, would have the possibility to avoid having to to report uh, remotely uh, into the EU. Um, I am sure that there will be more areas to in which um, uh, new uh, exchange of information frameworks will be set up, uh, but I would like to to perhaps um, end with a. a for most of you a bit more optimistic and positive note uh, it was mentioned uh, the word bureaucracy was mentioned and burdens uh, what i do see as uh, as a future also emerging from from what we hear from countries is that it should not only be about more more and more information but there sh there is also a trend that we see emerging uh, to get better information uh, better information uh, that makes it better for taxpayers, for those that need to do the reporting, and, and for the tax authorities. And, and maybe just to explain that a little bit, uh, I mean, the challenge uh, that we have uh, in, in an international context is that all the systems that we set up and frameworks that we set up serve many countries, and countries have different tax regimes. Um, and if you develop a reporting regime that serves multiple countries, the information will always give only a vague picture uh, of uh, the income. It does not give information that is precise enough uh, to get rid of uh, uh, potentially burdensome tax declaration obligations on the taxpayers. It will still lead to the fact that tax administrations can only use the information uh, for uh, post-factum risk assessments. Uh, it cannot be used for pre-populated tax returns. And, and also what we see is that in, the, in these uh, exchange frameworks, those um, entities that have reporting obligations are often still subject to processes that are pretty burdensome and paper-based and old-fashioned, uh, in particular, uh, thinking about the processes needed to identify who the customer is and what the residence is of the customer. And this is, these are all areas where we believe that the, uh, with, with new technology, improve, uh, significant uh, improvements uh, can be made. Um, uh, and, and perhaps for those of you that are interested, um, last a couple of weeks ago, there was the plenary meeting of the um, Forum on Tax Administrations, uh, which brings together the tax administrations, the commissioners of, of the, the most, the biggest uh, countries of the biggest uh, tax administrations. And one of the, the papers uh, that were, that was uh, issued there was a discussion paper on, uh, that articulated a vision for tax administration 3.0, 
uh, a vision for a digital transformation of the tax administration. And, and what we see is an emergence of a trend to uh, systems where taxation uh, will be more seamless and, and less burdensome for all stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before we, we include all participants in the discussion, first the debate, Thorsten Klein will open Vice President Public Policy MasterCard. We're all customers, Thorsten, so you should be already happy, but what can your system contribute to tax transparency and fairness? And what is your recommendation for your commission and maybe also for OECD? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Jäger, and uh, good afternoon to all uh, members of Parliament and uh, the Commission and uh, panelists. Um, so, uh, thank you for having me here, and uh, certainly a very, very interesting topic. Um, um, MasterCard is, of course, uh, uh, working as a technology company within payments, and uh, so, so um, our take on um, on the topic of fair taxation and cashless is, of course, coming from exactly that angle of uh, electronic payments. And so let me start off by a focus on this one. And uh, I heard before uh, very often this is about uh, ensuring that um, we manage for on the side of governments to collect tax taxes. Um, obviously, uh, when transactions are conducted uh, via electronic means, um, there is absolutely a very, very limited chance of pocketing uh, the amount of these kind of transactions. So, of course, uh, looking at society across Europe, um, I'm coming from Germany, in Germany it's even more true, um, we are still very cash heavy in many areas. and. Of course, uh, with respect to cash, uh, there is a chance to pocket, uh, pocket cash, uh, pocket uh, revenues that you as a retailer, for example, um, collect from the consumer. With electronic transactions, uh, this uh, cannot, be, uh, cannot be done. And uh, ultimately, this, uh, of course, is going to help um, governments, uh, in many cases, um, the cities and municipalities that are currently um, losing a lot of uh, tax income um, to really um, ensure that they uh, collect the taxes or that there's less tax avoidance. There was a study from Ernest and Young, or well, not only one study, but a couple of studies that really looked into this and, and came to the conclusion that by fostering um, policies around that, um, governments would be able to really ensure um, that there would be um, less uh, loss to tax avoidance and uh, a fairer share of uh, taxation. Um, clearly, clearly uh, looking into or fostering electronic payments, therefore, um, we would uh, really tackle um, uh, the tax avoidance in a way that it would ensure that there's a level playing field amongst all retailers. Um, it uh, ultimately would help uh, that uh, the tax gap would uh, get smaller. And uh, of course, it would combat shadow economy. Um, on the positive side, um, not only because of, uh, not only due to the recent unfortunate situation with COVID, um, but also before because of innovations taking place within electronic payments. I'm talking about contactless payments, I'm talking about many other uh, ways uh, for consumers, uh, overall shift in consumer um, behavior and payments, but it was uh, clearly COVID, the COVID pandemic has been a catalyst also for electronic payments in many ways. Um, so we've seen more retailers uh, introducing electronic payments uh, also in order to um, address consumer wishes because uh, consumers wanted to pay electronically often, but also in order to protect, uh, protect their own employees as a cashier uh, when, uh, when you don't have to handle cash and uh, to really move forward uh, with um, just a contactless payment. So um, we've conducted a study with the help of uh, 
GFK, uh, GFK uh, one of the largest um, institutes in Germany, and they um, came to the conclusion that uh, since the pandemic, 65% of Germans use cash less often than before, and 35% uh, of these people indicated that they would continue to do so um, after um, the pandemic as well. Um, the similar, similar thing, um, similar numbers exist for Europe on the European level. So, um, looking into this, um, we let's say what what needs to be done. Um, what needs to be done from our perspective? Of course. Um, we should, we should look or governments uh, should look into possibilities to really foster this, uh, to foster electronic payments further. And uh, what I mean by that is to really um, ensure that fiscal policies uh, also address this. Um, fiscal policies in many countries are doing so already, um, but uh, not, not across Europe and not in every country. So ultimately, Consumers should be able to make their payment at the point of sale electronically whenever they wish to pay or they have to pay. Wish to pay, I mean, of course, for personal goods, have to pay public administration, public services, which is not the case everywhere yet. Um, and this could be, could be mandated through policy. And uh, I'm, I'm saying mandated, but I don't mean, mean all, all ne always necessarily a very strict mandate. It could also work on the basis of incentives uh, to uh, retailers and merchants. And, um, and at that very end, uh, everyone would be uh, benefiting from that. Uh, we would have uh, helped to create a level playing field amongst retailers. Uh, who don't have any interest that their um, competitor pockets cash and uh, has a better margin than they do. And, um, and of course, uh, consumers uh, that can have a choice, and I'm not talking about that consumers should necessarily have to pay electronically, but just they should have the option. And uh, society overall would also benefit from it by collecting uh, more tax, uh, which would overall help uh, tax fairness and help to try out tax evasion. Thank you very much. That's uh, thoughts from our side. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so now it's very fascinating uh, uh, corporate and also the speaker, Francois Chadwick, Vice President Finance, Tax, Accounting, Uber. So your drivers say, say, they are part of the shadow economy or what, how you contribute that it's, it's to ensure that, that things are always working correctly because you have an interesting approach to solve this problem. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone and thank you for the invite to, uh, to be able to be here. So um, at Uber, we've actually, <clears throat> excuse me, we've seen this as a constantly uh, evolving global issue and um, we have been very, very involved in this transparency discussion for almost five years now, uh, working with various different governments, tax authorities, the OECD, we were very involved in the uh, project that uh, Philip was talking about. And, and the, the sort of the North Star that we've been, we've been focused on is making sure that the uh, data sharing rules are uh, enacted in a way or any model rules are put out there in a, in a way that captures what is actually intended to be captured to account for every single business model nuance. So um, in these discussions that we've been having, we've been very open and very transparent about the various different business models that we have to make sure that what is actually uh, expected to be captured is captured, is shared, and is, is actually usable because We've had instances where uh, governments have asked for every single piece of information, and there's a lot of it. And once we've provided that, we found that the governments have not been actually able to use it. And so we, we find that an upfront, open dialogue, what is actually needed, and then we're able to craft it in a way, including whatever the legislation may be, to be able to get the information to facilitate the needs of tax authorities and regulators around the world. Um, if you look at what we've, what we've actually done, 
with respect to sort of the DAC 7 and the OECD mo model of reporting rules, what we said, similar to what I've just said, is that not one size fits all for every single industry or business model. And so it's very important for governments and regulators to understand what they're actually looking for, what they actually need, and then we can make the ask. And also from a sort of a data sharing principle, um, a couple of things that we are very keen to make sure occurs is one, to make sure that there is a level playing field. If we're going to put these, put these rules on the table, then they should account and apply to everybody who is in the same industry. That means not, not, not considering thresholds, unless they're very low thresholds, and not having any differences between in-country or out-of-country uh, uh, companies or businesses. We obviously want it all to be backed by binding legislation. If anything isn't backed by binding legislation, we have found in countries around the world that other uh, companies in our similar space may not actually uh, abide by the rules. And then the th third point I'd make with respect to a data sharing principle is that um, goes back to the point I mentioned earlier, making sure that the data that is shared is what is actually needed. Otherwise, too much information will, uh, will sort of burden the system and won't actually meet the needs. Moving on to uh, what you were just mentioning there, uh, the ways in which we can help our driver partners and the ways that we can help our fleet partners such that they, uh, as the, one of my peer speakers mentioned early on, these are the backbone of the economy. These are businesses. These are individuals that are having the ability to earn. Uh, and the ways that we can help those uh, individuals, the driver partners or the, the restaurant partners or the fleet partners, the way that we can help them make sure that they don't sit in the shadow economy and that they are reporting correctly. We have, uh, we have detailed invoicing on every single transaction that is there, whether, whether that's uh, through electronic, whether it's through a card, uh, such as like MasterCard we're just talking about, but we also still have cash on our platform. So cash is, is a thing that occurs in certain countries. And so what we have is we have uh, the details for every single one of those transactions. So with respect to how we help the driver partners, the restaurant partners, uh, we do it through uh, three sort of main pillars. One is inform, the second one is support, with the third one being report. So under the pillar of inform, we actually provide driver and courier and restaurant tax briefing notes when they come onto the platform. We, we also have customized uh, web pages for VAT and in some instances income tax um, that are translated into, into their respective languages. And we also point them to uh, relevant web pages that are applicable in each country. So that's our, under the inform pillar. With respect to support, we provide everybody with a tax summary of everything. That's, that's uh, something that's provided through the year and obviously with a year end statement. Uh, in many countries, they're moving to e invoicing. So we are, we are actually uh, onboarding various countries through the e-invoicing regime. And also, where needed, we also do the self-billing. As it comes to the last pillar, which is reporting, uh, we actually, as I say, in countries where there is uh, some form of actual report, we uh, help to prepare the reports. We send the reports either to the individuals or whoever is on the platform. And in some instances, we have to send those directly to a regulator or a tax authority. That is all done. It's very much uh, transparent and uh, very much in the open. So the last remark I'd make is we as a company are also making a, a, a great deal of investment into the internal tech bills to actually support that implementation. And as Philip mentioned in the uh, one of the prior discussions, uh, the, the, having that that uh, in, uh, investment in those uh, tech bills is vitally important. And that's where having a, a situation where it's, it's more um, regularized across various countries makes it much more efficient for both companies and uh, the regulators and tax officials. So something that Uber is very much leaning into, something that we're very proud of and something we will continue to do. So thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Francois. Now, the last um, debate contribution, Hermann Paminger, um, Secretary General of the European Casino Association. So, cashless or cash casino? <laughs> Tell us the truth. <laughs> well, you know, in, in this case, I would prefer cash. No, uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for being invited to this esteemed panel, I have to say. Well, um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the casino industry and the gambling industry uh, throughout Europe um, and also touch on taxation and on some, you know, in transparency, unfairness and uh, not a balanced market approach, so to say. Well, casinos, you know, uh, basically we were in, invented as a taxation tool, you know, the society members that uh, could afford it should come, should play, and casinos play high taxes to the emperor or the government. And this is uh, where we are coming from. And this is why we are in such posh buildings, as you can see behind me, okay? Now, you know, these days have changed and gambling has become something completely different today. And furthermore, in the pandemic. And uh, with regard to taxation, we have the following issue. In Europe, if you want to be part of the gambling industry, what you need uh, to do business is uh, to have a license, a license from a national government that allows you to do this business and to run it. And uh, you pay very high taxes. The taxes vary between um, 20% and up to 80% in the European Union, depending uh, on the country. Um, we are very compliant, of course, uh, to our governments. But what we are seeing uh, is, uh, since many years, the development of uh, an unfair competition. And the competition is basically coming from the online industry. Although we accept, you know, nationally licensed online gaming uh, industries. We also partner with some of them, but there is a huge, what is so-called a gray market. Basically, you know, cross-border offers that are situated in other countries. Um, the European gaming industry is an industry in online gaming, which makes amount, amount, an amount of around 24 billion uh, in revenues. It's growing by 13% annually. And uh, the estimates are that this is only 50% of the real market. The rest is made, you know, out of countries that are, so to say, tax havens or uh, other countries where online operators are situated and they offer their products. In my home country, in Austria, you can play on 400 different websites, you know, in offer their products in the German uh, language, and you can play online at any time, you know, and uh, make some turnover there. And this is, uh, I don't, the Austrian government is not seeing a single or euro of tax uh, with this, with regard to these revenues. And uh, therefore, you know, uh, we are calling on uh, the European institutions basically to um, go or to support in the national EU member countries that uh, this situation is fixed, that this kind of uh, uh, illegal uh, gaming where uh, gambling is offered, you know, without the necessary license um, stops and comes to an end. And, uh, you know, when you stand on the, always stand on the lookout for new things, you might forget what's happening on your ship. So basically, you know, check your ship. There are some tax revenues that you can basically um, get to into your budgets uh, to support, you know, what you need, especially, you know, when coming out of the crisis, which for us is uh, an even bigger problem. We have helped and we are very thankful that our industry is helped by the different governments in order to stay afloat. Uh, we support 340,000 direct and indirect jobs here in the European Union, and we have 70,000 employees and, uh, you know, um, this, uh, we hope very much that this is supported and that uh, we have the chance to basically reestablish our businesses uh, in the future. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, so now we are starting the debate. Um, first, I have a short 
remark from taxpayers president Wolf von Hohenau. And then, if you have any, I have two questions to um, MasterCard. And then, if you have any question, raise your hand or type it. Then we can read it. So, Wolf, the floor is yours. Very short and brief, please. Only uh, two or three remarks out of, out of the view of the Taxpayers Association of Europe. The best way to to avoid uh, uh, tax fraud and uh, is to have simple taxes, simple and low taxes. And I invite you tomorrow at, at, at uh, 17 o'clock in the afternoon, we will uh, present you the newest research of Richard Feder from the Ohio University, who is, who is one of the best, uh, uh, has one of the best researchers about taxation and growth. And uh, he shows examples how to manage uh, how to manage tax systems. He, he he made a research that from the high tax states, the high tax states, and the complicated tax states in the United States, the biggest movement from from people to the lower lower uh, uh, states to the low tax states was uh, was running. And so that's very important to have simple taxes to have low taxes. And one one other remark. We have in, in different countries in the European Union, we have quite good tax systems, but we don't have the, the administrations to collect the systems or we have, we have a, a fraud there in the, in, in, in the administration. So it must be a very uh, important way for us to, to look that all the countries collect their, their taxes because the taxes who are not collected by some countries in the, in the European Union, they have to be paid by the, by the other countries. So we have a very high tax uh, country in Germany, but we have, we have a quite good a collection of, of the taxes. And uh, if I compare it to other countries, we know it from, from our, from our uh, organizations, in, for example, in the eastern part or, or in the southern part of Europe, then we know that the administrations are not able to collect the taxes as it should be. I think that's also a very, very important topic, and it's always important of the first the contribution. Now, two questions to uh, Thorsten Klein. Uh, so, what do you mean by mandatory acceptance? Uh, could you provide some further information, insight into this, and give concrete examples of uh, viable policy measures? And in addition, do you concrete have uh, concrete examples how policies could be more effective in achieving tax transparency? So, uh, Thorsten, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jäger. Um, um, of course, there, there are different ways of uh, how governments uh, or policymakers could address what I meant by uh, uh, mandatory, um, mandatory policies in order to help to avoid uh, taxation uh, or uh, tax fraud. Um, with respect to that, uh, thinking about you can, you can pay in cash essentially everywhere, but you cannot pay everywhere where you wish or need to pay by electronic means. So uh, you could you could focus on um, saying, okay, we uh, address this by mandatory policies, making it, for example, mandatory for um, retailers or institutions to have the acceptance of a pan-European working uh, card electronic payments um, in areas that are of public interest. So for example, uh, of course, uh, public transport, uh, mobility, anything that has to do with this. We are discussing it at the moment when it comes to electric vehicle charging because you want to be able to travel across borders and, and make your payment. And uh, uh, or the, uh, the Sioux or whatever you can think of. So in certain areas or for daily spend, it should be made mandatory. And by that you uh, would really ensure um, that um, um, there's no tax avoidance there. The second part is uh, a softer mandate. Uh, and we've seen that in Greece. So in Greece, for example, government uh, went down the route by incentivizing small and medium uh, merchants and retailers to um, really offer electronic payments, uh, have acceptance for electronic payments there, 
by giving them a tax benefit of, uh, I believe it was 1% or 2% even for a certain time if they include the option for the consumer to uh, make an electronic payment. So ultimately the consumer has the choice if I pay electronically, um, um, the uh, retailer doesn't have any chance of tax avoidance. Very simple. Um, and uh, a very concrete example now, uh, where, could, where could we do this in a better way? Um, in Germany, we, uh, everybody knows about the Bonpflicht uh, and, the, and the law was called something a lot like uh, the tax against the manipulation of uh, digital records or something. Um, it has to do with the cash register, M meaning every uh, retailer has to uh, have a manipulation free, manipulating free um, tax re uh, register, cash register. And, um, and uh, of course, this goes too short. This kind of law goes too short. This fiscal policy goes too short. Because at the very end, um, of course, uh, a small retailer with the intention of avoiding tax just simply does not punch in um, what, he, what he sold for if the consumer is not asking for. So how often do you as a consumer ask for if you just buy something small and you don't really care about the receipt? And so... They are not. They are not necessarily punching that into the into the cash register. Um, it could be very very easy if you uh, com uh, combine it with, um, of course, a terminal, so that that there's a mandatory acceptance of electronic payments because then you have the consumer helping you. The consumer can ensure if he pays electronically um, that of course this uh, transaction is being uh, taxed as well. Um, and I'm clearly not saying that all the consumers should pay electronically. Of course, every consumer should still um, be able to pay cash. So it goes the other way around as well. But I'm just saying we need the level playing field. So to have consumer choice that consumers can uh, really um, uh, ensure that uh, they have uh, the choice how to pay and that there's no tax evasion possible. It's good to hear that you do not advocate uh, uh, just only uh, cashless payments. Thank you very much. Thanks. No, uh, clearly not. Clearly not. I'm a consumer myself, and I just want, but I want to have the choice. I want to have the choice, um, and uh, but I also want, uh, as an employee, my taxes is uh, my taxes deducted automatically, right? Yes. When I go and buy something for my family, I want to ensure uh, that the merchant where I buy also pays his fair share uh, because I want health uh, healthcare, uh, streets, police, everything to work as a society. So I just want everybody to participate in a fair way. That's really important. So now if you have any further question, I don't see any questions yet. So just type it uh, and to whom? Um, so that now do you have possibility? Otherwise, so who gave a contribution um, François Chadwick or Hermann Kaminger, if or uh, Philip Kerbs, Ben Engel, if, if you have any comment to, to what the others said, so also use the time. We have still some minutes left before uh, Paul Rubik will close the event. So if you have any contribution, any question, just type it and send it to, to all, to everybody. I don't, I don't see any. Any uh, question yet? So it could, could be a good signal or a bad signal. I don't know. I can, but so um, maybe if Paul. I can, just, if I can make just a comment on the the, yes. the topic addressed by the previous speaker by Torsten um, on this idea of mandatory acceptance of um, electronic payment. Um, as it stands, uh, it would be problematic under uh, public law um, because um, under public law, uh, only cash is legal tender. And the very definition is legal ten of legal tender is that it cannot be uh, rejected for a payment operation. It is a default solution in case uh, the parties to a contract cannot agree on something else. 
we have had a long discussion some 10 years ago on uh, how to define legal tender. Uh, there was a recommendation of the commission which was adopted in the definition of legal tender of the euro. We have the first court case before the ECJ, which is ongoing is, uh, in Germany, actually, uh, with recommendation from the Advocate General, uh, which tend to follow the uh, position held by the Commission. The situation is slowly evolving, but one element that you need to keep in mind uh, in this debate is um, that in some member states, we still have a large part of the population without bank account. And uh, in that sense, uh, as long as you have people without a bank account uh, and therefore without a card, it is necessary to ensure the supply of a universally accepted uh, means of payment. And that uh, can only be cash. I know that there are legislation which have been put in place on offering minimum banking services to the citizen, but I think it's fair to say that if, it's, if you're homeless and push the door of a bank uh, to try to get the bank account and a card, it is not that easy. Uh, so maybe the things will change because the long-term evolution is clearly in favor of electronic payment, but we are not fully there yet. If I if respond to that real quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, very quickly, uh, just because you have a lot, a lot of floor, very quickly we have some commentation. Please. Okay, uh, no, go, go ahead. Okay, so um, very interesting contribution and that, that's really important also, Philip, because, uh, uh, because it, it's, if, if we were talking, if you have a grandfather who wants to give some money to his grandchild at Christmas, should he do it cashless? So, or, or a beggar sitting outside, he needs something, or a bakery to buy uh, bread for 27 cents. And so we, we said, that's why it's not all, all in the mountain in Bavaria, uh, everything cashless it will not work. So that's also important to think about where it's fruitful or not. And there's one interesting um, uh, 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 commentation also, uh, just maybe you can answer it first and two, um, the payment, for instance, if you don't pay, uh, I'm not allowed to pay with, with cash anymore, you pay with cigarettes or gold, whatever. And also we have a restriction already in Germany if you want to make a transfer, 5,000 euro, that's possible cashless. So uh, I like cash, otherwise you'd have to do it cashless. So uh, there are always the alternatives. So it should be a strict regulation or more freedom. So I think we, the taxpayers and the economic Senate, cash is also part of the individual freedom and the possibilities and also security. So this uh, commences too, maybe. And there's another question, is, it, is there a fair solution for all? Um, so that's that's the first part of the questions. Please, who want to answer? Fair solution restriction already exists. Do we have to stop cash pay the cash payments totally, or what is the right solution? So, in my previous position, I've been in charge of uh, Eurocash for a long time, so uh, I might be a bit conflicted. Um, at this stage, at, at, as things stand, no country in the world has made the step of dropping cash. Uh, some have been talking about it for a long time, like Singapore, for instance. Some clearly make uh, a much bigger use of an electronic payment than others, in the case of the Netherlands, for instance, in Europe. But dropping cash completely uh, would be a step that uh, would require a number of important uh, changes. Uh, in public law, uh, but also uh, in the way we organize um, payment systems today um, in Europe, since uh, we would need the world population to have access to a free non-cash means of payment. And uh, we're not there yet. We would need also to ensure the adequate level of data protection. Uh, since by definition cash is anonymous, uh, while uh, an electronic payment uh, can be uh, potentially monitored. So it's a fine balance. I think uh, it, there is no doubt that from a taxation point of view, electronic payment are better than cash. And that's the reason why 
in a number of countries, we have accepted lower limitation on cash payment than what is standardly uh, imposed under the AML uh, legislation. Uh, some countries like Italy have gone, uh, uh, sorry, Greece has been as, uh, have gone as low as 1,000 euro, and Italy uh, was also uh, close to this level. With good and with good reason from a tax point of view each time, but there's a difference between lowering uh, the level for cash payment and refusing cash payment. Rejecting cash payment, uh, and the person speaking actually is someone who makes very little use of cash, uh, I don't think the society is ready for. So that might be the case in a decades from now, uh, but that is, uh, mm, certainly not the current situation. And we have countries in Europe where cash is still uh, used a lot, starting with the first economy uh, of Europe, Germany, which is clearly uh, for whatever reason, a cash addicted country. Thank, thank you very much. As a commentation, if you want to raise a question and you are not familiar with English, please, uh, please uh, write it in German, we translate it. I have two further uh, Okay, or when you register, that's also important. So I, I got always an invoice with value well, added tax number of, of the driver of Uber after a drive. But often I buy digital service from companies outside Europe and I don't get a proper invoice for my bookkeeping. Is there a solution? Yeah, that's a real problem outside of the European Union. Um, so for us, with the finance administration, it's also maybe for, for European Commission, it's a problem because if you have such an invoice, it could happen that it's not accepted without a, a regular VIT or a tax ID number. So that's really a problem. So is there a solution? <laughs> I think not. Or maybe it, maybe Philip cares from OECD because we have the total overview. Uh, I, I am unfortunately not a VAT expert. I've always stayed very far away from it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm afraid I will not have the magical solution for you on this one. Okay. Yeah, but, but that's really important. For a corporate, for sure, it's, it's not, so it's not a problem, but for a customer, and then if you buy it, there's more goods, that's a real problem, but it's not the topic of today, but it's interesting uh, contribution. Thanks. So, um, example, Skype invoices, at least in the past. So that's, that was the contribution. So I don't see any further questions. If you have any, any questions later on, we will send it to SME uh, Connect. And we will share it. Maybe we can we can do it this way. Then Paul uh, Rubik, uh, president of SME Connect. So the floor is yours. You give your closing remarks to sum up and give the solution uh, out from the view of Austria. Always Austria has very good solutions. So how what should we do? What should be done from your perspective? And to sum up, thank you, Paul. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. I'm always very pleased that uh, we think on uh, the situation of SMEs. Uh, which have, of course, uh, a big problem uh, with the COVID crisis now. And uh, we have to do everything uh, uh, to rethink the question of recovery uh, and give them the chance uh, to survive. And I think uh, a survive kit uh, should be also developed uh, out of the area of taxation. Which instruments do we have uh, uh, and how can we uh, be engaged uh, in this area? Uh, I want to thank uh, Enik Göri um, because I think Hungary did a very good job uh, in uh, giving a good chance to SMEs. Uh, that uh, the nine percent uh, I think is not uh, a run uh, uh, to the bottom. Uh, I think, uh, especially for the people who work, uh, it's always good to see that they. Uh, are not burdened by, by too much tax. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, consumption is something, uh, especially in the environmental area, uh, where we should uh, take care uh, how to get uh, better solutions. And uh, as we know all uh, that uh, uh, international companies are very clever in uh, organizing uh, good uh, solutions for themselves. So we also should have a debate on uh, maybe a, a, a parcel levy uh, or a levy per kilogram for delivering of parcels, but it's maybe a crazy idea. Uh, uh, but to go away from, from high taxation, 
uh, from the people who, who bring the parcel uh, and uh, deduct it uh, from, from their uh, tax bill. Uh, I think that would be a good incentive uh, for people who, who make good service uh, uh, for all of us. And uh, in ECO, I, I think it, it, it's very clear uh, that there is a tax competition, not only on, on European level, it's, it's also on global level, but we need a framework uh, for it. And uh, so how is the question, how can we cut red tape in, in taxation uh, in Austria, uh, if you buy shares, uh, automatically uh, the tax is uh, reduced from, from, from your account at, at the shares. So you don't have to make any declaration. Uh, it's done by your bank and your broker. Uh, and I think that's models which will come up more and more in the future. Uh, we see that blockchain uh, gives us a very good opportunity uh, to do it uh, fully, 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 uh, fully automatically. And uh, if uh, Benjamin Angel has spoken uh, from the race uh, to the bottom, uh, maybe the 9% in, 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 in Hungary, uh, but if you look uh, to Ireland, uh, it's still in, in, in other situation. Uh, and I think that the taxation from European Union uh, to the staff uh, and to the officials on, of European Union uh, by 25% uh, should be the top uh, of taxation uh, for the people who really do uh, the work. So uh, we shouldn't have a, a threshold, from, not only from the button, but especially from the top. And I think the 25% from uh, uh, EU officials would be uh, a, a very good uh, solution to have it as, as a top level. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, Philip Graves, uh, the cri uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, of course, are, are a global development. And uh, we have hundreds of, of cryptocurrencies. And uh, if you see uh, which kind of fraud is uh, uh, in a lot of areas uh, used also by uh, uh, special units at military uh, to do transactions uh, which are totally unlegal. Uh, it, it's necessary to see how we can get uh, uh, also transparency and, and uh, uh, security into, into this area of, of cryptocurrencies. So we would need a, a legal framework uh, to allow this uh, competition on currencies uh, moving away from the monopoly, uh, but uh, having a framework uh, for options in this area. And uh, I also learned that uh, uh, the, the, the reduction on taxation on, product, on production would help uh, the consumers. And uh, if we change uh, to consumption of environmental goods uh, and deduct it from the production, uh, it would be also good for the global level uh, because if I look to OECD uh, and, and, and Philip brought it uh, to the point, how can we have a, a plain level field uh, on, a, on a global uh, development? Uh, and therefore, I think it's good uh, that we have the taxpayers organization uh, to get uh, better transparency, uh, to look on the SMEs. I've heard that SMEs at least uh, pay 80% of, of the tax. Uh, 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 it's clear that they employ two thirds of, of the employees uh, and having 50% of the GDP uh, in the now through COVID crisis. Uh, I think it's good if we think on, on, the, on the people who do the daily services for us, uh, who are still in production uh, and, and give us uh, the pleasure of uh, good uh, living uh, and not uh, changing to poverty uh, which a lot of people in, in politics think uh, that it would be uh, a good solution. Uh, I think it, it's good to see uh, that uh, Europe uh, comes to a, a position uh, where we also could take a global leadership uh, in a transparent and, and uh, fair taxation system, which should be not burdensome. Uh, it should be uh, automatically uh, driven so that uh, bureaucrats uh, uh, bureaucracy in this area uh, is uh, detected and uh, said it's very transparent for all of us. Uh, I think uh, this debate is, is very, very important uh, in, 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 in the present uh, uh, situation. 
uh, we would need uh, depreciation for for our SMEs, uh, also a full tech stop uh, if there is a, a full quarantine and if people can't work. So uh, it's always good to have a balanced system where both sides uh, are pleased. And uh, I can I think this kind of debate uh, is, is is very useful uh, because it gives us a certainty that we listen to each other and uh, that we understand our arguments. And uh, at least in politics, uh, we need compromise. Uh, and a good compromise is always better than a bad war. So in this, uh, I want to thank you very much. Um, I wish you also a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, and many thanks for everybody who uh, did, who used the chance to be within the debate. And it will be not the last one. Thank you.